All right. Open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 30, if you would, please. You did not bring a Bible with you. There should be one in the racks in front of you someplace, so grab a Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 30. We'll be there in just a minute. Before we go there, though, I want to ask you guys a question. Where do you live? Just shout out your answers. Where do you live? Here. Okay. 13th Street. With me. Okay. Yeah, just shout them out. By the walking park? What else? Where do you live? On Earth? What? United States of America? That, yeah, by the golf course? That's good. Milky Way Galaxy. Excellent. Okay. All legitimate answers. Okay. There is no wrong. What's that? In the kingdom of God. I wondered if anyone was going to get that. <laughs> you know, we... When we say, where do we live, there are so many different ways to answer that question. And if you notice, today's sermon is entitled, Living Higher. And I want to first tell you a story I read in a fascinating book. The book is not about this at all. This is like one chapter in the book. The book is actually confronting Jezebel. It's a, it's a book about the uh, 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 spirit of intimidation. So not about this at all. But in the last chapter, he talks about this. He tells a story about watching his cat stalk a bird. Has anyone ever seen a cat stalk a bird? I mean, if you really think about it, house cats are, well, they'd be like me. You know, they'd be out there like, oh, I'm a real hunter. Yeah, I'm going to get me some, but they don't ever catch anything, you know, because they're evolutionary leftovers, if you will. They just don't have it in them anymore because they eat cat food too often. Now, so what the, if you've ever seen this, this is what the cat does. You ever seen them get their shoulders? You know, they do this thing. And they, they get up and they just kind of move their shoulders. And then the bird hops out of range. So then the cat creeps closer and does his shoulders. And the bird hops out of range again. And the cat comes one more time. Again. And the bird finally goes, you know, this guy's going to leave me alone. So he just takes off. And then the cat, being a cat, decides he's going to pretend he didn't care anyway. So he just starts cleaning himself. I didn't want that bird, really. It's, it's no big deal. Uh... That's what, yeah. <laughs> that is what happens when a cat is chasing a bird because a bird has three dimensions in, its, in which it can travel. It can travel front to back, side to side, and up. But a cat can only travel front to back and side to side. I mean, it can climb up a tree, but it is limited by gravity, whereas a bird is not. A bird can live higher than the cat. Now, we as Christians also have three dimensions in which we can live. We have the body, which is the material world. This is uh, uh, people who live in the physical world uh, spend their time and energy on uh, money, physical possessions, physical pleasure, comfort, food. Those kind of things are all of this physical realm. And in America, most people have come to the acceptance that that is not the best place to live. And we all know somebody who's gotten rich and is still miserable because they thought money was going to make them happy and it didn't make them happy, right? I mean, that's, that story's been told in America over and over again. And so what America has done is they say, we need to not live in the body. We need to live in the soul. That is your emotions, your intellect, your, your passions and desires. And people who live in their soul are happier than people who live just in the body. Now, that's true. The problem is the body is front to back. The soul is side to side. They're all still on the ground. Because your body and your soul are both broken. Like the bird and the cat, if we live on the two dimensions that are broken, we're living in the devil's living room. And he has authority and dominion over us. And when he stalks, have I mean, you ever seen a cat stalk a bird that can't fly? They bat it around and play with it and torture the poor thing because they know he can't go anywhere. That's what it's like for Christians who live in their body or their soul. So where do you live? You say, well, I don't live in my body. I know better than to spend all my time on physical possessions or physical pleasure. It's fleeting. So I spend time with my family. Well, what is that? That's social interaction. You're seeking acceptance and relationship, which is good. It's better than the physical, but it's not spiritual. Now, it can be. Don't get me wrong. Family is important. I'm not dissing on family. But there are people who will place family in the, th in the throne of their lives and end up just as miserable as everybody else because they're still living on the physical plane where the cat has dominion. 
And that cat, by the way, is the devil who's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I think it's interesting that if you look at that verse, he says, he's a roaring lion going back and forth. Notice it doesn't say it going up. If you're a Christian living on the, the two dimensions in the devil's playground, all you got to do is take off. And the devil will sit there and go, I didn't want him anyway. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the devil doesn't clean himself with his tongue. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Was that too much? Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. You have to choose to fly. Uh, let me tell you a funny story. Well, it wasn't funny at the time. It was horrendously scary at the time. But Kara and I were lying in bed the other, uh, this last week, and I wake up to this just awful noise. It was like, yeah, just, oh, it was terrible. And you could hear it clear as day. And we leave our, our, our window open at night for fresh air. And, and so, uh, I, you know, Kara finally, she's like, what is that noise? I don't know. So she closes the window, and I can still hear it. I thought, that's got to be coming from inside the house. What is that? I'm thinking, my first thought, I didn't tell Kara this, my first thought was, one of my children's demon-possessed and they're spewing pea soup everywhere. <laughs> it was 4.30 in the morning, okay? I was barely awake. So <laughs> I get out of bed and throw my robe on, and as I'm putting my robe on, I realize, I recognize the sound. That's my bird. That's Emmett. And he, may, he only makes that noise when I'm punishing him for something he's not supposed to do. Like if I, if I pick him up with my hand, oh, he hates that. He makes this chirping noise. It's just I can't do it like he can. So I go out into the living room where his cage is, and, and he's not in his cage. I can hear him, but it's kind of echoing around. You know, we put those hardwood floors in, so you can't tell where any sound's coming from. And finally, I think, well, he, it's coming from downstairs. So I go downstairs, and, and the bird is sitting in the corner uh, at the base of the stairs, just sitting there making this horrible noise. And that's it. He wasn't stuck in nothing. He wasn't limping. He wasn't like on his, you know, on his side with his wings singing. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And then suddenly I see a shadow out of the corner of my eye as this shadow tries to skulk around the corner to go upstairs. It was my cat, Phantom, had somehow found his way inside, knew that he was totally busted and was trying to sneak around before I grabbed him. Well, he did not get out on his own two feet, four feet. <laughs> In fact, he soared across, the one time cats fly, he soared across the yard and landed in some snow. He's fine, by the way, for you cat lovers. Like, oh, don't throw the kid. He deserved it, okay? I almost ate my bird. <laughs> What's that? That's right. <laughs> I heard him. But, you know, as I, as I was preparing this, I wrote this sermon like days after this happened. And as I'm writing this stuff down... You know, the thought came to me, we often as believers will sit there at the base of the stairs waiting for God to come save us as the devil is standing there in front of us. And we'll make noise and we'll cry out to the Lord and we'll say, God, please save me. And God says, I gave you wings. That cat can't get you if you'll just take off. Now, God will sometimes rescue us when we're being whiny butts like that. He will because he's a gracious, loving God, but he wants you to eventually learn how to fly. Now, what's funny is that my bird can fly because we haven't trimmed his wings in like six months. Now, of course, he's, he's in an enclosed space. We can't take off, but he could, get, he could have gotten away from Phantom easily. He could have flown up on top of something, and, but he was at the, on the floor of all the places to go, the only reason he's still alive is because my cat's not that dumb, heard me coming and thought, I'm going to die, <laughs> and went and hid. Okay, that's the only reason my bird's still alive. So as believers, what we need to make sure we do is we need to choose to fly. We need to choose to live higher because as long as we live on this plane, we're subject to the enemy. You know, Jesus says, I give you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Those are both symbols for demonic forces. But, you know, we get trampled on all the time because you can't trample someone from underneath. You can only trample them when you're above them. We have got to choose to live higher. I'm going to give you three steps. There's probably more. Well, I'm sure there's more. But these are the three that God gave me. Three things that we can do to live higher. The first one comes from 1 Samuel chapter 30. So if you've got that, uh, well, these are horrendously out of order. In fact, I don't even know what that one is. Well, let's just go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, or excuse me, chapter 30. Oh, they're backwards. Okay. 
1 Samuel chapter 30, starting in verse 3. We've talked about this story before. Uh, David goes off to battle, and the kings, the Philistines are like, you can't fight with us, go home. And then in verse 3, it says, So David and his men came to the town, this is where they were living, and behold, it was burned, and their wives and sons and daughters were taken captive. Then David and the men with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives had also been taken captive, Ahinoman the Jezreelite and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. David was greatly distressed, for the men spoke of stoning him because the souls of all of them were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and daughters. Now, I just want to point out something here before we keep reading. First of all, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, back then when they raided a town, they only took some people captive. They usually killed most of them. Now, all the men were gone, and we'll find out later that they hadn't killed any of them. Everybody got them back. But, I mean, they were upset. But notice what they didn't do. They didn't say, let's go get them. You notice that? They said, let's get David. They just assumed defeat. And we do that as believers so often when the devil comes against us, whether it be a, we start feeling a cold coming in our body or whether it be a bad report from a doctor or whether it be fear of something that's coming, we need to make sure that we don't let the devil beat us up because if we assume defeat, we'll be defeated. So look at what it says here. Verse, I think we're ready for verse 6. David was greatly distressed, for the men spoke of stoning him because of the souls of all of them were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David wasn't about to accept defeat. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Look at what it says he did. Verse 7, David said, David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray you bring me the ephod. And Abathar brought the ephod, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him, Pursue, for you shall, you shall, you shall surely overtake them without fail, or and without fail, recover all. So David's men just assumed defeat, but David remembered something. I don't have to live on this plane. I don't have to accept defeat. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord because I know with his strength I can fly. David's done it before. He's flown before. He killed Goliath when he was a teenager. I mean, this guy's done some pretty, some pretty good stuff. And so he does not accept defeat, but rather he seeks out the, uh, the wisdom of the Lord. Step number one, how to fly. Do not give in to the temptation to despair. Do not give in to the temptation of despair. When we come into resistance, and we're going to come into resistance, okay? When we come into resistance, the temptation to despair is always there. That word despair literally means to give up, to say there's no hope. And we are tempted to do that every time we come into resistance. We need to make sure that we don't give in to that temptation, that instead we do what David did. We seek the Lord, and then obey what he said. Go down to verse 16. I want to show you something here. God told him to go after the people, and he goes after him. Verse 16, and when he had brought David down, behold, the raiders were spread abroad over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken from the lands of the Philistines and the lands of Judah. And David smote them from twilight even to the evening of the next day. That's 24 hours, and not a man of them escaped except 400 youths who rode on camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, small or great, sons or daughters, spoils or anything that had been taken. David recovered all. David flew. Not only did he not give in to the temptation of despair, but he sought God's wisdom and then he obeyed God's wisdom and he flew. He should not have been able to recover all. Statistically, that should not have happened. Somebody should have died in the battle, okay? Somebody should have, but they recovered everything. Not only that, consider this. These guys raided not only the lands of Judah, but the lands of the Philistines. David got a lot more besides what they had taken. He got everybody else's spoiled too. All right, so step number one, don't give in to the temptation to despair. The next one comes from 2 Kings. So flip forward here. 2 Kings chapter 3. This is after David, after Solomon. The two kingdoms have split. There's now not just Israel. There's Israel and Judah. The northern tribes of Israel eventually became the territory named Samaria, which we see in the New Testament. They intermarried, and Samaria had always had problems with idolatry. Judah did too. They both got uh, kicked out, but only the lower tribes came back. 
So the northern tribes always sinful people. This is where uh, Ahab and Jezebel ruled, okay? So it was that kind of place. Now, we've, Ahab and Jezebel have died, all right? And uh, their son, is it Joram? Do I have that right? I think it's Joram. Yeah, Joram decides that he's going to go against somebody. So he goes and gets Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel, who's a righteous king. He says, hey, come on, help me come, come tackle these people. Come on, let's go get them. And Jehoshaphat made a mistake and said, like, okay, well, I'll join sides with you. Never join sides with an enemy who's ready to fight someone, okay? If, if they're going to battle and they're not a believer, don't join sides with them because they're going to get you in trouble every time. All right, it's a side note. So Jehoshaphat joins, they go into battle, and then all of a sudden there's a lot more waiting for them than they thought. And look in verse, uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 10. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called us to the, or has, the Lord has called these, us three kings together to be delivered into Moab's hands. <laughs> what an idiot. He picked the fight to begin with, and then he goes into battle, and he says, not only does he accept defeat right off the bat, oh, we're going to die, but he blames it on God. The Lord has delivered us so that we would die at the hands of the Moabites, or however you would pronounce that. Jehoshaphat's not so stupid, though. Look at verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here by whom we may inquire of the Lord? I love Jehoshaphat's answer. Now, wait a second, wait a second. Before we just accept defeat, are there, is there no prophet here? Let's go seek what God wants to do. Notice Joram didn't even think of that. Didn't even cross his mind. So Jehoshaphat said, let's find someone. Verse 11, second half, he says, one of the kings, one of the king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who served Elijah, is here. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So Joram, king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to Elisha. Okay, now just put yourself in Elisha's shoes, okay? Elisha lives in the northern tribes. He's been putting up with, uh, with um, er, or, uh, yeah, Jezebel and what was, what was it? Ahab, there we go. I was going to say Aram, that's not right. He's been putting up with Ahab and Jezebel most of his life, these wicked people that were out to destroy the worship of God. And so he's a very frustrated person. And then they get this new king, Joram, which is their son, and he thinks, well, maybe we've got a chance. Joram just turns out to be just as bad plus an idiot. Okay, at least Jezebel was intelligent. This guy's an idiot, and he's sinful. So Elisha doesn't like him. Go to verse 13. Uh, and Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? I love that. Say, what do you want with me? He says, go to the prophets of your wicked father Ahab and your wicked mother Jezebel. Get out of here. You got, I got nothing to say to you. I want to show you something here before we move on. Go to verse 7. No, excuse me, that's the wrong section. Uh, go to verse, oh, where is it, 13. Oh yeah, verse 13, second half. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called us three kings together to be, to be delivered into the hands of Moab. I just want to point something out here before we move on. So Joram says, God has delivered us into their hands to be defeated. So then he goes to a prophet and says, Tell us what God says, because God's already delivered us into the hands of the Moabites. Why was he seeking God? He didn't want an answer. He was just doing what Jehoshaphat told him to do. He already believed what he wanted to believe. He believed that God had, had turned him into the Moabites and was going to kill him. So why was he bothered? I mean, Elisha had every right to be angry with this guy. He was a hypocrite to boot. He was sinful, an idiot, and a hypocrite. Okay, so I'm a little angry at him myself. Go to verse 14. And Elisha says, I love this, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I respect the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. You know what that sounds like to me? Talk to the hand. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like that? I don't even want to look at you. I don't even want to acknowledge your presence. But because you're here with Jehoshaphat, I'm going to respect him. Elisha's ticked. This guy is mad. Now, what's the problem with that? They have come to Elisha to ask him what God has to say. There's something about being angry that prevents you from being able to hear from God. You got to get yourself calmed down before God can speak to your spirit. Because when you're angry, your soul is really loud. 
You guys know what I'm talking about? Well, they did this, and I did that, and they were so mean to me, and I can't believe they cheated me, and all this kind of stuff. It's all going around in your head. You can't hear from God when your soul's being that loud. So look at what Elisha does. He's madder than a hornet at, uh, at Joram. The only reason he's even talking to him is because Jehoshaphat's in the, in the room. Look at verse 15. But now bring me a minstrel. It's a musician. And while the minstrel played, the hand and power of the Lord came upon Elisha. What happened? Elisha decided to take some time to get into the spirit. Put that in quotation marks if you're taking notes. Get into the spirit. What does that mean? It means to shut your soul down so that your spirit can hear clearly. Uh, Karen, I just, we rode with some people down to this conference and, uh, uh, there were a couple of times where there were multiple conversations happening at the same time. You guys, you know, you're riding in the car with six people and they, two people are talking to each other, two other people are talking to each other, the other two people are talking to each other and you're trying to listen and then somebody from the back tries to talk to you and you've got to listen through all that noise. That's really hard. That's what's going on when we're angry or afraid or frustrated, our soul's making all this noise and we can't hear from God. But if we will worship, you guys remember what worship is? Placing yourself under, submitting your mind to God, submitting your, your, your heart to God, submitting your will to God, getting yourself submitted to God so you're only thinking about him, only feeling about him, and only wanting what he wants. And when you do that, your spirit gets on top and works like an antenna, and suddenly you can hear God clearer. That's why most prophecies and gifts of the spirit and things like that occur after a time of worship. Have you ever been to a charismatic church where people are, you know, moving in the gifts of the Spirit? It's always after the worship time. It's rarely any other time because the worship time is where we're supposed to get ourselves focused. It's one of the reasons why we go ahead and have our, our, our music all before we get to the communion and the sermon. Because those are the two main parts of the service other than the worship. And so that worship is supposed to calm ourselves down so that we can hear from God when he's ready to speak to us. That's what Elisha's doing. Step number two. Get into the spirit, or I would say take time to get into the spirit. Now, for Elisha, this was music. And for a lot of people, it's music. I knew a guy, music did nothing for him. <laughs> Just nothing. He didn't like music, didn't care about music. I think he said the last album he bought was the Cow Sills. <laughs> I had to look him up. I thought he was kidding. It was like the Cow Sills, that's really the name of a band? Anyway. Uh, and But he loved to be outside. He was an outdoorsman. You know, we'd go on trips and people would be staying in a hotel and he'd be out sleeping in the bed of his pickup truck. Loved to be outside. And when he would go outside, it would calm his soul down so he could focus on God. And this guy was a man of faith like I, like I rarely see. I mean, he really believed that God was real and was going to take care of him. And he lives that every day. And he is able to do that because he takes time to get into the spirit. He's not even a charismatic. He's an Anabaptist. They don't even believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but he operates in more faith than I've seen in most charismatic churches because he takes time to shut his soul down so his spirit can get on top. Whatever that means for you. Uh, <clears throat> I don't usually recommend reading your Bible for uh, getting into the Spirit because it's engaging your mind too much. For some people, that's what they got to do. Other people, it's prayer. Other people, it's music. Uh, uh, Gary, you love going fishing. I love, one time he told me, he said, I'd feel closer to God in a fishing boat <laughs> than anywhere else. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter where, but you got to take the time to do it because if you don't, your soul's going to take over. And as long as you live in the soulish realm, you're subject to the cat. But if you'll take time to get in the spirit, you take off. The devil's got no control over you. Number three comes from Romans, way over to the New Testament. Romans chapter four, I got to wrap this up. Romans chapter four. The Apostle Paul is talking about the father Abraham. Now, for those of you who don't know, which is probably none of you, but just in case, uh, Abraham was given a promise by God that he would be the father of many nations. He was 90 years old, his wife was 80, and she'd been barren her entire life. So the chances of him having a kid, physically speaking, are zero. Okay? So let's see what happens here. Uh, chapter 4, starting at verse 18. For Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been promised. And the promise said, so numberless shall, shall your descendants be. That's Genesis chapter 15. 
He did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief and distrust made, or no unbelief or distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. Now, I want to show you something here. In the King James, it's probably the best translation of the actual Greek. It says, I don't have the King James Version, but I got it written down here. It says, he considered not his body. That would have been verse 19. He didn't consider his body. In other words, step number three is not considering the physical. One of the devil's biggest, well, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say the devil's biggest tool is deception. He loves to trick people. And he'll trick you into believing all kinds of ridiculous stuff that will cost you dearly. And one of the things he wants to trick you into is looking at the physical. God's word says that he will take care of all of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And the devil, the cat, comes over and pounces and says, yeah, but there's no money in the checkbook. That verse is great, but you can't turn it into the bank and pay your bills with it. Well, yeah, but it also says that as I give, it'll be given to me. Yeah, but you gave away all your money. Now the church has it all and you don't have any. Right? Yeah, anybody ever heard that before? <laughs> I'm the only one who's heard that. Fine. You know, when we look at the physical... We are not looking at God. Remember I said that earlier today? Fear comes when we're looking at the wrong thing. When we are looking at the physical, on the physical plane, or even in the soulish realm, when we're looking how our heart feels or what our mind thinks, we will end up being pounced on by the devil because the only way to fly is to operate in faith. And faith is the substance of things not seen. You can't look around at your physical circumstances to determine your reality. You have to look at the word of God. Now, that sounds ridiculous, especially for us Greek Americans. You're like, I'm not Greek. Greek philosophy. America's got a lot of borrowed a lot from Greek and Roman philosophy. And, you know, we, we love our science. And we love knowing everything. Well, okay, I love knowing everything. Other people don't care as much. But, uh, you know, we like knowing the truth, at least. And we like being able to prove the truth with empirical data. I got some empirical data for you. God is God. And what he says trumps what you see. Can you say amen to that? If nothing else, what God says is more important than what you see with your eyes. All you see with your eyes is a reflection of light anyway. You know how easy it is to trick your eyes? We cannot look or focus or meditate on the physical if we're going to fly. Because if you ever watched a bird take off, they always look up first. It's good, too, because if they didn't and took off and there was something there, they'd end up back on the ground. <laughs> but, you know, they always look up and then take off. And that's what we need to do. We need to look up because that's how we fly. You know, I remember when I was first learning about faith in God's word as it trumps physical circumstances. I remember one time talking to my pastor, and some of you have heard this story before, but I told him, I said, look, even the word of God has to submit to reality. He laughed himself out his chair. He said, no, it doesn't. His word is reality. He said, come on, Micah, you know better than that. I didn't, by the way. Thank you, Steve, <laughs> for having faith in me. Because I thought that the physical world was what's real. And he asked, he asked me this question. He says, do you believe you're saved? And I said, yeah, I, I know I'm saved. How do you know you're saved? Because God's word says that if I believe and confess and whatever, you know, that I'm saved. He said, okay. Do you see any evidence of that salvation? I see some. It wasn't much at the time. <laughs> he said, do, do you see any evidence to the contrary? Yeah, all the time. He said, are you going to believe that you've lost your salvation because you don't see any evidence of it anymore? He said, well, no, that's silly. He said, then why would you doubt any of, any of God's other promises because of what you see? If you believe that you're saved despite the evidence to the contrary, why would you believe that God's other promises aren't as legit? He said, well, salvation is more important. True, but either God's not a liar or he's not a liar, okay? If he's not a liar, then everything he said was just as true as everything else he said. So step number three is don't focus on the physical. You can't if you're going to take off. I got some other stuff, but I, I, don't, I think we're just going to drop it. I want to close with this. 
when we as believers are being beaten up by the devil, my first question to you is needs to be, are you flying or are you crawling? You ever seen a bird try to, I mean, you know, roadrunners are pretty fast, but you know, most birds, they just kind of hop, hop, hop. Our ducks are really funny when they try to walk on land. They just don't look as good on land as they do in the air. Christians don't look as good on land as they do in the air. In fact, we don't even look as good on land as other people look as good on land. You know, unbelievers, they actually make it look pretty good walking around, strutting their stuff. And us Christians, we try to do it. We're stumbling and falling. We're like, oh, this is miserable. How do you guys do it? It's because they're of the world. We are not. We don't belong in the air or on the ground. We belong in the air. And when we glide and fly, oh, my gosh, the world takes notice and says, that's gorgeous. What do you have? But as long as you're waddling around on the ground like a duck, they're not going to look at you and say, what do you have? They're going to say, what do you got? <laughs> They're going to see, assume you got some kind of funky disease making you do that. We need to make sure that we choose every day, sometimes every hour, to do what's necessary to fly. Because if we don't, we're going to get beat up by the devil. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that through the power of the Spirit, we can fly that we have the option, that we don't have to submit to the, the power and the destruction of the devil, that we don't have to let him beat us up, but that we can take off and fly. Lord, I pray that each of us would have a clear ear to you, that we could put ourselves under our spirit so that your spirit can speak clearly to us, that we might be able to not give in to the temptation of despair, that we might focus on you and not our circumstances. Thank you for your promises and your word. And thank you for your faithfulness to us, even when we are faithless. Father, bless us in everything we do. Help us to share that truth with others that they can live in the sky and not on the ground. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.